Well, those of you that are members weren't surprised to have numerous Christmas songs being sung in May. For those of you that are visitors, you might be asking yourself, what is going on here? Are they working on some other time frame? Is this like a, a, a Jewish time schedule? Well, it has nothing to do with that. There, there's, there's not a different form of calendar that we use around here, but instead we try to, to sing along a theme of whatever it is that we will be preaching upon that day. Not perfectly, but in a general way, we will strive to do that. And I am preaching on the beginning of Luke chapter 2. And so our theme is upon the birth of Christ. We don't generally in this church, actually I don't think we ever have, preached in any kind of a, a calendar way. So you don't get a normal Easter sermon on Easter, although we will preach Christ and Him crucified. We will call people to trust in Christ on Easter as we do every other Sunday of the year. And likewise, when we come around Christmas time, what's generally known as Christmas time, we don't eschew that or tell people that they can't celebrate Christmas within their families, but we don't change our calendar around here. We don't come up with a new preaching schedule. We generally preach whatever text is next. And we're preaching through the Gospel of Luke, and here we are at the birth narrative, at the birth of our Lord Christ Jesus. Let's go ahead and read that passage. Luke chapter 2 and verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, friends, these familiar passages can be some of the most difficult passages to preach. There are just associations that we, associations that we have, associations that we have with passages like this Sometimes it's even difficult for Bible translators to translate verses into English because people have such a normal expectation of particular verses that although the meaning might have changed in English, they continue to translate it the same way. The most famous of that would be John 3.16, which in the King James Version says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if you're anything like me, as a young child, I was reading King James. I was memorizing the verses in Vacation Bible School in King James and at home in King James. As I got a little older, we began to use the New International Version. Then as I got a little older... I converted to Christianity, not that there's an association between the two, but I started using the New American Standard Version. I began to use that in doing street evangelism, and I began to memorize many um, evangelistic verses in the New American Standard. And then I began to look around and found that nobody else was using the New American Standard Bible, and everyone around me had the ESV, so I began to use the English Standard Version. And so there's difficulties that I have sometimes when I'm saying certain verses, or you even notice as I'm doing the Lord's Prayer, it's like, why can't Pastor White say it correctly? Well, because I've said the Lord's Prayer in four different versions, and as a child, I memorized it in the King James Version. And so it's very common that I begin to say a verse or a passage, and I begin to mix in my New International Version and King James Version as I'm saying it. One of the struggles that they have with the Um, King James Version in John 3.16 is that the meaning of the word so had a particular meaning at that time in the 17th century. And the so in that passage generally meant what it did mean when they translated it was in this way. 
Well, you've been to, perhaps you have, if you grew up in churches like I did, you would have revivals, and you would have a preacher that would come by and, and preach at that time, and he would be clinging to the pulpit, and his face would be red, and he would have a handkerchief that he was wiping away his sweat as he walked through this passage, and he would begin to state it in the King James Version, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him. Some of you are laughing. You've been to one of these revivals. You, you've, you, you associate this passage that way. And so you read this in modern English as though God has such an emotional attachment toward the world. As you would say that, I so love my wife. Or someone may say, I so love this or I so love that. And they're, they're meaning like, I really, really, really love this thing. That's not what it means in the Greek. And so you will have English translations that continue to translate it with the word so. And even though they've taken out the whosoever, we still accidentally throw it in there every now and then, even though we would never use the word whosoever any other time except for when we're reading this verse. And so you even have it in the King James, in the English Standard Version, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Maybe sometimes you even mess that up and say, everlasting life. I do that all the time. The Holman Christian Standard, one, one um, commentator, actually one uh, Greek scholar named Mounts makes this point that the Holman Christian Standard does a really good job of translating this verse. And they sought to translate it in a way that's very consistent with what the Greek says in a way that we generally understand the words in modern English. And they say it this way, for God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. There was no small controversy for them to translate it that way. People were shocked to see the verse that they were so accustomed to, a verse that they loved and had grown to say in a certain way, but they were saying it in a way in English that wasn't the way that they generally use those words, and so it was confusing. I'll say all that to say this. The same is going to be true with this text in front of us now. We approach this text with great, great familiarity. We approach this text with so many preconceived notions, even life experiences that distract us. I, I tell you, I came to this text with certain ideas that I was shocked were overwhelmingly not true, were overwhelmingly not in this passage, that commentaries overwhelmingly did not support the way I was brought up to understand this passage, the way I had seen this passage demonstrated throughout history, the history of my life, that is, but even history in the church. We, we, you have seen Christmas plays. You've been in Christmas plays. The difficult part is some of your kids and grandkids have been in Christmas plays that have played parts in this narrative that don't exist. Some of us have sung Christmas hymns that sing so much about this area and where they were and what was going on around them that's not in the text, that we don't have evidence that should lead us to even believe that is true. Things that the writers aren't even mentioning here, the writers not even mentioning. So I'm just putting that on the table starting out, just laying that on the pulpit. Um, some of you here today, I'm going to crush some of your great Christmas memories. I'm sorry. I know they were special to you. I'm not taking away from that. But the goal here is to exegete the text and understand this passage within its historical context. And here's what's really important, is that the goal here is to emphasize what the writer is emphasizing. The writer here is emphasizing the Messiah and who Jesus is and making a contrast between Christ and His kingdom, Christ and His lordship, with the lordship of the kings of the world. So three aspects we're going to pull out of this, and some of it will be just unpacking some things and kind of resetting the table even. But we're going to walk through the historical Messiah. Secondly, we'll talk about the prophesied Messiah. 
And thirdly, we're going to land down on the humble Messiah, the historical, prophesied, and humble Messiah. Let's begin on that first point, the historical Messiah. We see that in the first three verses here of Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And we've talked about this many times, but this is one more piece of evidence that supports the uniqueness of Christianity. Christianity is unique among the world's religions because the authors are writing about the religion near the time when the events occurred, and they're giving historically verifiable information. They're giving information that could be falsified by people that are living in that time period. They're not writing 500 years later like so many other world religions are. They're not writing like many generations after. They're writing very near the time when these events occurred. So that doesn't always mean that we can historically verify everything that is in here. It doesn't mean that we can go back and and find this exact census the way it's laid out. It doesn't mean that every piece of, you know, historical evidence is supported by something in archaeology, but it does mean that the writers did what so few writers in world religion do, and that is to give falsifiable information, things that the original audience could have verified, things that the original audience would have been familiar with, things that if they were lying about, the original audience would not have accepted. They would not have laid their life down for these writings. They would not have laid their life down for these scriptures. Because you need to remember that at the time when these things were written, this was of no small controversy in Rome. That's how Luke would have spoken of it. This was no small controversy. There are many diasporas that would happen. Christians would get persecuted, um, and Jews would get persecuted, but then it would just result mainly in the Christians getting persecuted. And for several centuries... Christians had to lay down their lives for these writings. Christians had to be willing to lay their life down to worship Jesus rather than Caesar. And why would they do that if they knew these things to be a lie? Why would they do that if they knew the writings were in error? This is something that makes Christianity unique, something that makes Christianity special amongst all of the world world's religions. And Luke, as a historian, is using great specifics here. So we have something that many of you are going to be familiar with. You studied these, these things in um, history in high school. You studied these, these things in literature even. Shakespeare wrote about some of the things that, that happened very near the time before Jesus came. And Caesar Augustus is one that the Lord is using at this time to providentially bring his decree to pass. Augustus is making a decree. See, but Augustus is making a decree because the Lord had decreed that Augustus would make this decree, that Augustus would call people to go to their original towns to participate in the census so that he could tax them And that's what's happening here, so that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, so that Christ would be born in the place where it was prophesied by Micah that he would be born. Now, Caesar Augustus was the son of Julius Caesar. Um, If you remember your history and literature, it was Brutus and Cassius, along with others that had worked to assassinate Julius Caesar. But upon that assassination, Octavian Octavian is the one who will become Augustus. Octavian joined with Mark Anthony against Brutus and Cassius, and they took control over the Roman Empire. Now, Mark Anthony ended up going west. He was with Cleopatra, and there began to be a division between the western and the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. Octavius took control of the Roman Empire there at the Battle of Actum. It was a great sea battle. If you're a naval historian, then you're familiar with the sea battle that happened between the Egyptian sailors and the Roman sailors, and Octavian was was successful. Mark Anthony and Cleopatra ended up committing suicide. 
shortly after their defeat. So this secured Octavius, Octavian as emperor of Rome. He was undisputed at this time, and he is the, really the first great Caesar of the Roman Empire. He is the one that will be established. He will be given the name Augustus, Augustus meaning majestic or, or elevated. He was a prolific ruler. He was a great ruler, not great in a moral sense, but great in a worldly sense. And his ability to command the empire and to squash those that were under him, under his rule, but also do so in a way that didn't lead to um, so many riots and uprisings. James Edwards says this, Augustus built the Roman Forum, founded libraries, sponsored lavish spectacles for the populace, and boasted that he had found Rome built in brick, but left it in marble. Augustus was the first emperor to encourage a cult to deify his name and reign. Yes, that's right. He believed that he was a god, and they began to worship him as though he was a god. This is something that would lead to the execution of many Christians. And the way that you would worship Caesar would be very simple. It was such a simple thing that you had to do. You merely just had to take a pinch of incense and, and toss it into the fire and declare that Caesar is Lord. That's all that you had to do. And in doing that, you were acknowledging the rule of Caesar. Now, you could go and do your own religion, but you were acknowledging that you were bowing down to Caesar. Now, Christians would not do that because they understood what that was communicating. They understood that they were communicating here that Augustus Caesar was actually a god and that they were to be bowing down to him, that they were to be worshiping him. To refuse that would lead to your death immediately. Soldiers were told to put a spear in the side of those that did not follow through with this very basic thing. Such a small thing to do, just, just a little incense. You can imagine how different people would, would try to justify this. But allegiance must be to Christ. It is a violation of the first commandment to worship anyone other than the Lord. And so as a great ruler, as all great rulers do, they need to fund their projects. They need to pay for their great ideas that they want other people to do. And so they tax, and that's what he was doing here. He was calling all the people in Rome to participate in a census. And two things that they get out of the census, the first is taxation, and the second is military service. Now, the Jews did not have to participate in military service, but they were required to pay the tax. And so this, this declaration was given by Augustus to participate in this. And here's what I want you to get out of this first point. I want you to see the sovereignty of God, the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord here is doing what He always does. The Lord is using the free actions of men men who are acting freely upon their own desires, and the Lord is accomplishing His good purpose even through those actions. The Lord didn't force Augustus Caesar to go and to call a census. He didn't force him to create taxation. He didn't force him to go to battle with Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. He didn't force him to do any of these things. Augustus Caesar is doing these things in his own volition, in his own desires, but the Lord is using even what he does to accomplish his good purpose. God is so sovereign, God is so powerful that he uses even the actions of powerful kings who are acting according to their own desires to bring about his good and holy purpose. Craig Evans makes this point. He says, just as the edict of the Persian king Cyrus to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple accomplished God's plans, so Augustus' order that the census should be taken played an important part in God's redemptive plan. And that's what he's doing here. He's using the actions of this emperor to accomplish his good purpose. Augustus believes he is sovereign, but he is acting according to what the Lord is allowing him to do, what the Lord is calling him to do even at this point. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he 
wills. That is the sovereignty of God. That is the power of the Lord. The Lord does what He wills, and the Lord is accomplishing His good purpose at this time with all that has happened so far. Even in these sinful actions, even in the sinful actions of someone like Alexander the Great who has gone forward and has terrorized nations and has brought them into Greece. And in that process, he was spreading the Greek language all the way into the far, far east. And it will be that Greek language, that common Koine Greek that the apostles will be using to spread the message of Christ Jesus to the world. See, the Lord is accomplishing His good purpose even through these sinful actions of these leaders. But God's purpose in these actions is different than the purpose that these leaders intended. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 4, says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. At the right time, at the time that the Lord had so chosen to send the Lord Jesus Christ, that is when He sent Him to accomplish His good purpose on God's timeline. God wasn't fretting. The Lord wasn't fretting in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. The Lord wasn't fretting when Alexander the Great was terrorizing the world. The Lord wasn't fretting when Alexander the Great died. The Lord wasn't fretting as the Roman Empire began to grow, and the empires grow, and the empires fall. But the Lord continues to reign. The Lord continues to accomplish His redemptive purpose through His means and through His methods. So we see this historical Messiah. We see the Lord sending Christ Jesus into the world when He has determined He would come to accomplish His good purpose using the Lord's means, not worldly means. In this historical Messiah, we see Him as the prophesied Messiah. He's not just sending Him when He desires to send Him. He certainly is, but He's sending Him in a way that had been prophesied by many authors previously. It was prophesied that a Messiah would come forward even early into the garden, right after man had sinned. The Lord said He would send a child of the woman to crush the head of the serpent, and that was the beginning of a great many prophecies about this Messiah that would come forward from the writers of Scripture. So we see this prophesied Messiah here, beginning in verse 3. It says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Now, the Messiah was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem. That's a very important point that Luke is trying to bring out here. We see this prophecy given in Micah chapter 5. And that's why Luke is emphasizing it here, because it has been it has been prophesied that the Messiah will come out of the city of David, will come out of Bethlehem. We see that in Micah 5, beginning in verse 2. It says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, then the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. And the Lord is bringing this to pass. The Lord has said this is what will happen, that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, and the Lord is using a decree by a pagan king to bring this to pass. And even a Jewish custom is coming into play here, because all over Rome, people didn't have to go back to the town from which they were born. That was a Jewish custom. That was a Jewish way of, of, of um, 
categorizing the people in the culture, was to categorize them based upon the clans that they came from, the family that they came from, and the town that they came from. And so Rome is one that although they demanded taxes, they were also very comfortable assimilating to whatever cultures that were there to try to keep peace. They would rule, but they would rule in a way that was most acceptable to the people over which they were ruling. And so this was important to the Jews, and so this is likely something that was being handled by King Herod at the time. King Herod, by the way, is one who was, although he was a puppet king, all right, he was, he was put there by Roman rulers, he is one that was allowed to take the title King of the Jews. It's a very important title that he had there because most people in the Roman Empire were not allowed to take the title king, but he was given that title, and it was because this was a special people, and the Romans wanted to keep peace in this area, and they struggled for centuries trying to keep peace in this particular area. And so because of this, because of this decree, because of even this prophecy that was given, they lived in Nazareth, but they had to walk to Bethlehem. It was about a 90-mile walk. And they're going back to Bethlehem because of their Davidic heritage. That's another piece that's being emphasized here in what Luke is writing. This is probably the third or fourth time that we're seeing an emphasis back upon the Davidic heritage, that Jesus being this line that's coming out of David, that Jesus being the one that's going to sit upon the throne of David. And so this may be a small family. They may not be wealthy. They may not be of great means within this culture. They are in the royal line of David. And here Mary is called his betrothed, who was with child. I'm going to make some comments here about this of what I believe to be true, and I'm also going to deal with um, some errors that I've run into from people over the years. Most likely, the marriage ceremony had already happened, okay? They weren't just going through the normal betrothal at this time they had most likely already gone through the marriage ceremony. But Luke is intentionally using the word betrothed here at this time because he's emphasizing the fact that the marriage has not been consummated. That was a theme that is throughout the beginning parts of these Gospels that that is talking about this. And here's why I want to emphasize this, because I've had young people come to me before, and they've, they've tried to take a passage like this, and they've said, you look, Joseph is traveling with Mary, and, and they're not really married at this point, and they're just, uh, they're just, uh, they're just engaged, right? She's just betrothed. So, so there's no reason why I can't travel overnight and stay in a hotel with my girlfriend or my fiancé. What an incredible way of twisting a text like this. Not at all what Luke is saying. Say, no, not at all. That's not his point. It's not what Luke is intending for you to gather from this passage, and it's a distortion of the message in this passage. It's a distortion of much other wisdom that would be communicated in the Scriptures about how it is that two people that are not married should be interacting with each other. But you do have here a man who is betrothed to, to, his, to his wife, and they have not consummated the marriage. She is with child at this point, and it's because of the work of God that she is with child, and he's not leaving her back at home. He's taking her with her. Perhaps it's to watch over her because she's about to give birth. Perhaps she has to go and register herself as well. That isn't clear, but the point is is that this is not what we're to do with a passage like this. I also want to deal with a lot of superstition that surrounds this passage and, and others like this. There's a lot of superstition throughout history that has is, that is surrounded the birth of Jesus. Um, there, there have been arguments that are made. Actually, the Roman Catholic Church would make this argument. They would say that Jesus was the only child that Mary ever had, um, that, that, that Mary, Joseph never knew Mary after the birth of Jesus. She remained a virgin the entirety of her life. And I want to make a few arguments against that because this is a very common argument that's given by the Roman Catholic Church. Number one, this isn't a holier way to live. There is nothing that would be holier about two people that were married that were never intimate with one another. There's nothing in the Scriptures that would support that. In fact, there would be much in the Scriptures that would contradict that. Jesus was to be born to a virgin, and that is what happened. We don't need to read anything past that. Secondly, 
Jesus had other siblings. Mark 6 and verse 3. This is the argument they make there. They say, is, this, is, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not these his sisters here with us? So Jesus has other siblings. That's very clear in that passage. Thirdly, because someone may say, well, they were born before him. Number three, Jesus is firstborn. Jesus is called firstborn. Luke 2 and verse 7. And she gave, gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no place for him in the inn. The word that is used here doesn't mean only son, okay? The word here means firstborn. So in saying firstborn, the way it's being said in this passage, it's communicating the idea that there are other children that come afterward from this. Fourthly, when you look in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew says that Joseph knew not Mary until after Jesus was born. Matthew 1, beginning in verse 24, when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. We, we have no reason to take on these superstitions. We have no reason to read this faulty church tradition into a passage like this. Now, one of the reasons why people read such false ideas into this text is because there is, there is a writing called the Infancy Gospel of James, and it claims to clear all of this up. It describes Jesus' birth not as a normal, natural birth, but rather one where he's just basically beamed out of the womb. They just, she's pregnant at one point, and then the next moment, there he is. Jesus is in her hands. That's literally how it is described. There are some statements that are in that gospel that are so absurd. If I began to read them to you now, there would be some of you that would be meeting with me after the service, wanting to know why I would read something so inappropriate in a church service. Um, additionally, in this gospel, it doesn't sound anything like the writings of Scripture, okay? It doesn't sound anything like um, the way the writers of Scripture write. Um, there's this argument that Joseph has. Um, they clear all this up with these passages of Joseph having other children, and, and they say, well, he, it was from a previous marriage, and these children were there, and they go and they clear all of this up. There's all kinds of other fantastic things in this so-called gospel about Mary growing up and living in, in the temple. But the truth is, when you look at the writers of Scripture, they don't place a lot of emphasis upon Mary. She, she was greatly blessed. She, she was a beloved woman, but she was so because the Lord had chosen her to carry the Messiah. And the emphasis wasn't upon her. It wasn't upon her holiness. It wasn't upon her greatness. And when we begin to read these things into the passage, we take away the emphasis that God is placing in this passage. The emphasis upon the virgin birth is that Jesus came from God and not merely from men. This is a king and a priest that is coming forward. This is a holy one that is coming forward. This is the second Adam that is being brought forward, not coming from the line of the first Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 47, Paul says, The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. A second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. As with the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we, also, we shall also bear the image of the man of of heaven. The emphasis here is upon the fact that Jesus came forward not from natural, normal generation, but he came from heaven. And this is the means that the Lord is using to bring forward the second Adam. The second Adam that would come forward and represent his people, to represent his people rightly. This king that would come forward and rightly sit upon this throne, this one that was prophesied that would rule over and care for the people of God, rightly representing His people, rightly serving His people, rightly taking upon Himself the consequences of their sins. As Paul says in Romans 5, beginning in verse 18, he says, Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to the justification and life for all men. 
For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the reason for Luke emphasizing Christ coming in the way in which he does, that this is one who's coming from heaven, that this is the second Adam, that all of us were born into sin because of the actions of our forefather, Adam, because of the actions of our first parents. We are born dead in our trespasses and sins. We are unable to help ourselves. We are ignorant. We are helpless. We are unholy. We need Christ as our prophet, our priest, and our king, that we would understand rightly, that we would be made clean, that we would be made whole, and that we would have one to rightly protect us. And that is what has been given here in Christ Jesus. That all that are in Adam died. All that are in Adam will fall under the wrath and curse of God. But all that are in Christ Jesus shall live. Christ Jesus did two things for His people. Christ Jesus took upon Himself the consequences of our sins. We bear naturally in our lives the guilt of our first father, Adam. We are born cursed into this world. We are born in sickness and in death. These, this is the reality of us. We are born with a sin nature. We are born not just sick, but we are born spiritually dead. Jesus takes that consequence upon himself. Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God. The wrath of God fell upon Christ Jesus. And Jesus did something else. Jesus fulfilled the law in every way. He never sinned, not even once in word, in thought, in deed, in desire. He was always consistent with the law of God. Unlike Adam and Eve, Adam sinned. And so he was not granted the benefits of obedience, but Jesus Christ obeyed the covenant of works. Jesus Christ was faithful in following the law of God, and He was granted the blessing of life. That is the inheritance, dear friends, that you have for you in Christ Jesus, if in fact you're in Christ Jesus. Oh, the first step, dear friend, that you must see, you must see your need for Jesus. You must see your need for Christ. You must see this story beyond just something that is, is on a Hallmark Christmas card. You must see this beyond just experiences that you've had or warm, fuzzy feelings in the mall. What God is doing here is making war against sin. King Jesus is invading the world. King Jesus is coming forward and declaring himself king. King Jesus is being what he is. But he is fighting and defending his people. He is establishing and earning an inheritance for his people. And oh, dear friends, you must see your need. You must see your need of Christ Jesus. You must see the reality of your sin. You must see the reality that your sin is something that God hates. It displeases God. So many don't like to talk that way. That doesn't make you feel good. That doesn't give you warm, fuzzy feelings to talk about the hatred that God has for sin. But you merely need to look at the cross. You merely need to look at the cross to see God's absolute hatred of sin. But God's not merely wrathful. God is also loving. God is also kind. God is also righteous and holy. In our understanding of all these attributes, we understand God cannot just let sin go. He can't just look the other way. As so many world religions would put it, well, I just hope that God forgives me. I just hope that God lets my sin go. I just hope that my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. That's not Christianity. That is man's religion. That, that is guilt upon guilt that you will bear through your life. That's not Christianity. No, Christianity says Jesus 
has done all that is necessary. Jesus has taken upon himself all that was necessary for my sin. Jesus has accomplished all that is necessary whereby I can reap the inheritance of a perfect life. That is justification. Just as if you never sinned, just as if you always lived your life perfectly. And that is granted to you not because of your works, not because of your goodness, but because of your trust in Christ Jesus. Because you see your sin, you see the reality of your sin, and you repent from that. It is a change of mindset first and foremost, that repentance. It is a recognition that this is sinful, this is displeasing to God, and it is a turn from that and a turn to Christ Jesus. And that's not the end of the matter. You are justified, that's the end of the matter there. There is peace between you and God, that's the end of the matter there. But the Lord's not finished with you. The Lord will continue to work in you. The Lord will continue to sanctify you. The Lord will continue to grant you a sanctifying repentance that you will turn from actual sins and turn toward Christ Jesus. It's for that reason that the Lord sent the Messiah, this one that happened, occurred, came, dwelt among us historically. This one that came that was prophesied but this one that came forward in a very humble circumstance. Not, not in the regalia that most emperors are walking around in. Not with the power that most emperors are walking around in. Not with the military might. He had all the angels in heaven that he could have brought down. And he did not bring down even a one. Verses 6 and 7 of Luke 1. And while they were there, a time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no place for them in the end. Okay. So this is a story that, as I said earlier, has become so familiar in our minds that it is a distraction to the text. And... So I gave you my warning earlier about squashing your, your Christmas memories. Um, some of you have children that have played parts in Christmas plays. You have grandchildren that have played parts in Christmas plays. And I'm going to tell you things that are going to contradict the reality of that Christmas pageant. You have Mary coming down the aisle, right, on a donkey, approaching the innkeeper, knocking on the door. And then the innkeeper says, I'm sorry, there's no room in the end. I think it was a Duck Dynasty episode where that just kept being the, the, the humor point, where they just kept repeating that over and over. There's no room in the end. The guy could never get it right until the end. Um, in a barn there, in a cave, there they are. You can go here to this cave full of animals, and that's where she Gave birth. I'm sorry if your child played the role of the innkeeper. Um, that's almost certainly not what happened. <laughs> almost certainly. There, there was not a time where they walked up to a medieval or renaissance type inn uh, that you would see like in, in England and found no rooms in the inn and had to go to the barn. David Garland, one commentator, says this. He says, the fiction of the heartless innkeeper who turns them away is not only a fantasy, it leads away from Luke's point. And that's what I want to emphasize here, that some of these, these themes that we have in our songs and these themes that we have in our Christmas plays and such are, are probably not what happened. Um, so we have the word here, katalamai, and this is the word that's translated in in this text. And again, I go back to where I began this sermon. Sometimes there's certain passages that are, that are translated certain ways historically that is very difficult for the translators to translate them differently because it's so shocking to people, and they're trying to sell Bibles. And so they're not trying to create controversy. They're trying to give people things that they want, things that make them comfortable, things that they are accustomed to. Um, and so... So let me give you some, some understanding of this word. This is the same word that is used for the room where the Last Supper was held. Um, this is the same word that is used for uh, the reference to the upper room when they're all gathered together. Um, you could generally understand this word to mean 
guest room, okay? All right, it's, it, and, and so that, that's how you would understand this. Basically, this would be a, a, a guest room that there wasn't, it wasn't a place for her to give birth. There was no place for them there in this guest room. And I, I want to give you some background to kind of understand how people lived during this time. Let me give you another quote from Garland. He says, the family cooked, ate, slept, and lived in the main room, and any animals were also brought in for the night and kept in a lower level of the living room where the feeding trough would be. Um, another commentator, Stein, that I want to mention, makes this point that there are no animals mentioned in the birth narrative ever. So this idea of all the animals around them, and then how is it always in the Christmas play, right? You, you've got the, the sheep and the goat and the cow and the, and the horse, and they're all shoved in there around. And uh, There's even a Christmas song where one of them's like keeping time as the kid's coming into play for little baby Jesus. And the reality is that the greatest Christmas plays that you might have seen in your life, the ones where they put the most expense into had the most animals. Am I right? You've got to bring Jesus, you've got to bring Mary in down the aisle on an actual donkey, right? And so everyone's shocked. Oh, there's actual animals walking through the auditorium of the church, and it's probably shocking to the maintenance people that have to clean up after all of this. And then with the wise men, I mean, you've got to bring in camels. I mean, if you really want to do this right, you really have to have as many animals as you can in the auditorium, and we're so accustomed to hearing the story through this certain lens, I think it's really distracted, distracting for us to understand this. So, so let's walk through this. So here, here's what I'm gathering from this, and the commentators overwhelmingly described it like this. That's what I'm shocked at. Overwhelmingly, this is how the commentators described this narrative, that at this time, you would have basically a large room, and that is where the family would live. They would eat, they would sleep, they would cook, they would kind of reside there. And then right next to that, sometimes it would be under it, sometimes it would be right next to it, there would be an area where the animals could be brought into for the night. There would be an area where they could feed the animals for, without going out of the house. They could basically grab what they needed to feed the animals put it into the manger there, and the animals could feed. And this was connected directly to this family room. You generally have kind of a half wall that was there. It could be, something could be brought over to cover it, but there would be easy access, kind of like you have at a window right here where you can access the other side of the wall. And then next to that, you would have a complete wall, and there would be a smaller room that would be the guest room, okay? This would be what you would use for guests that are coming in to visit. And so they didn't really have inns in the English sense, which you normally think of, right, where you have many rooms in one area. Um, I even want you to think of like the Good Samaritan, okay, the word that's used there where he brings the man to an inn, that's a different word, okay, that's a, that's a different idea, okay, he's actually bringing him to an inn where he's renting something. Mary and Joseph are from this town. They have family members from this town. This is an oriental culture, okay, and they are very hospitable, okay, so they're going to have places to stay, um, and so this area where it's almost like if you read Old Yeller and you have, they talk about the dog run, it's kind of that area where they walk out and it's kind of halfway outside, halfway inside, that's kind of what you, what I think you could imagine this to be, and, and also she probably wasn't riding on a donkey, they probably couldn't even afford a donkey, she probably had to walk the entirety of the 90 miles by foot. If you remember, as we will see here shortly, um, at the circumcision of Christ, they couldn't even afford a lamb, okay? They, they, they had to go and they had to buy the turtle doves, which is what you would buy if you were poor. So they weren't well off. They didn't have a lot of money. They likely didn't have a lot of animals. Animals would be something that people of more means would have. And so what Luke is doing here, the emphasis here is not on the animals in the inn and all of this. The, the emphasis here is on the way in which Christ is coming to the world, the, the humility in which this king of the universe, the one who spoke all things into existence from absolutely nothing, the way in which he is coming into the world, the way in which he is going to be ruling, and then the way in which these other kings that we see in this text 
are ruling because the people in this time period understand who Augustus Caesar is. Honestly, all of you understood who Augustus Caesar was even before I began to, to speak of him. We see Daniel speaking of some of these things back in Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 31. He says this, he says, You saw, O king, and behold, a great image, the image mighty and of exceeding brightness. Brightness stood before you, and the appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, the chest of arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of clay, partially of iron. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand and struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And you have Daniel. I know some of you are like, what's going on here? I'm going to explain it to you, but this is an important passage to understand because I think it is showing a contrast here that Luke is trying to communicate to us with the kingship of Jesus and what Jesus is going to do in these earthly leaders and all of their regalia, their power, and their wealth, and what is going to happen to them. And you have this generally understood, this statue that is here, where you have gold, silver, bronze, and iron. And we understand Babylonians to be gold. After that, the Persians were the silver. The Greek is the bronze. The Roman Empire is the, is the iron. And then you have this foundation of iron and clay. And I'm not going to emphasize the iron and the clay. People may have different theories on that. But, but the key here is that there is a stone that is cut out by no human hand, and it strikes upon the feet of this great statue, and it brings it tumbling down. And this stone that strikes grows into a mountain and fills the entirety of the world. And Jesus is that stone. Jesus is the, this rock that strikes upon the feet of all of these worldly empires because they are built upon sand. They are only as strong as the men that are ruling over them, and you go from one man to the next, and there is no more. Another empire comes over and takes that one over. And that's kind of the story, not just after Rome. We can continue to walk through. We can even look at our own empire in some ways, this country that we are a part of that has, you know, parts of the empire all over the world. I don't want to get in a distraction on that. But, but the way I want to view this is not in some kind of an end times newspaper where we're determining the Antichrist is going to come out of Russia, but rather to look at this and see the picture that is here, that these are great world powers. These are great powers that ruled. These are powers that ruled through worldly means, through worldly domination, through worldly ruling, and through violence. And Christ Jesus is that rock that comes forward. Christ Jesus is the one that strikes upon them. All these men die. All these empires ultimately fall. But the work of Christ, the rule of Christ, spread throughout the world. That is exactly what happens. Through a very small group of men, Christianity begins to spread throughout the entirety of the world. And you can scarcely find a place in the world where there's not the effects of Christianity. There are areas, especially in the 1040 window, where the evangelism is lacking. But it has spread throughout the world. That the, the Lord has accomplished His work in the spreading of the good news of Christ Jesus throughout this world. And we can even look around this room and see, see evidence of this. And the Lord used His means. The Lord used the means this humble servant that is coming forward, coming forward in, in poverty, be, being laid down here. Most likely, again, family members were around. This wasn't Joseph in a barn trying to figure out this birth all by himself. There were family members that were nearby. They were near the family room. There were people that were there. They would have moved the animals out. They're not here with a bunch of animals. But even still, the, the king of the universe laid there in the feeding trough. I'm sure they put some clean hay down, but he's laid there in, in the feeding trough. So 
what we need to grasp from a passage like this. Is the humility of the servant that comes forward. The lack of pomp and circum there's going to be pomp and circumstance when we have the angels and such come in, but, but, but not in a worldly way. Not in a worldly way. Working with Campus Crusade for Christ once, we, we were going around and we were sharing the gospel with different people upon this, um, this university in Monterey. I mean, it's called Altec, and we're sharing the gospel with different people. And I remember one of the, one of the leaders there said, you know what, I don't, maybe we're not going about this right. I mean, if we really want to, this is how young people get together and talk, if we really want to conquer this campus for Christ, then maybe we shouldn't be just talking to some random guy sitting alone in the cafeteria. Maybe we need to be going out and finding the leaders on this campus. We need to go out and find the, uh, the captain of the football team, or we need to find the leader of this or the leader of that. And he said that, and I thought about it for a second. I just thought about the disciples that, that Jesus chose, you know, mere fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, people that in some ways had, had, had very little in common, people that would have had animosity amongst one another. Some of these people were not well respected in the culture, and the Lord used those people to accomplish His good purpose so that you couldn't look to man as the one that accomplished this. It's not man who decided to spread Christianity all the way to India in the first century, but it's the work of God that did this. We can struggle with this, dear friends. I, I am so grateful when anyone comes to Christ. I'm so grateful when anyone comes to Christ Jesus. I think it is special when there is someone that is famous and they come to Christ Jesus. That is, you have, a, you have an acquaintance with this person. Maybe you've listened to their music. You, you've seen them play different sports. And the person comes to Christ and you have a joy because of that. And that's perfectly acceptable. That's perfectly good. But there are times, dear friends, where we're almost pining. We're, we're almost telling ourselves, well, if only this, we could get some famous people to become Christians, that would really legitimize us. That would really give us a standing within this culture. I tell you, that's not the means that the Lord uses. That's not what we need to be legitimized. That's not the means that the Lord used even in His coming. Jesus as King is being contrasted with these other earthly kings. Jesus is using even the actions of these earthly kings to bring about His good purpose. These kingdoms that are run through wealth, through violence, through forth, force, Jesus used none of these means. And yet Jesus is sovereign. There's not one square inch, as Abraham Kuyper says, not one square inch of the universe that Jesus doesn't declare, this is mine. We must not be seeking our saviors apart from Christ. We must not be trusting in those that would be an alternate form of Christ, that is what Augustus Caesar was being put forward as. Those are the names that were being attributed to Augustus Caesar. Harkarnathius, um, one historian, makes this point regarding Augustus Caesar. He says, Augustus is the father of the divine homeland Rome, inherited from his father Zeus, and a savior of the common folk. His foresight not only fulfilled the entreaties of all people, but surpassed them, making peace for land and sea, while cities bloom with order, harmony, good seasons. The productivity of all things is good and at its prime. There are fond hopes for the future and goodwill during the present, which fills all men, so that they ought to bear pleasing sacrifices and hymns. Augustus Caesar is known as the King of Peace. He's called a son of God. He is associated with good news and hope. Augustus Caesar is one who would come to be known as Dominus Edus, which means Lord and God. Caesar Augustus came to be known as the Savior of the world. And in the very next passage, when the angels begin to sing, you're going to see these terms ascribed to Jesus. So there was a so-called Pax Romana 
that existed. And the, the goal was to keep peace in Rome. And the Rome would use their worldly means to try to establish and hold on to peace, but it wasn't a true peace. It was a peace that came about through manipulation. It was a peace that came about through brute force and through tyranny. They did establish a degree of peace in order, and they ended up bankrupting themselves many centuries later, trying to keep that, that peace there. But the Lord here is bringing about a true peace. He's bringing a true peace into the world that's going to work through the hearts of men, and it's going to come about because of the work of the true King, Jesus Christ, not using the work of earthly weapons, earthly powers, but rather through the power of God, changing man from the inside out, making the man new, making him right. That's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, King Jesus, bringing about a true peace. King Jesus, who is the Savior of the world, for He is saving men from their greatest enemy, death and sin. King Jesus, who is making peace first and foremost between man and God, and out from that, making peace between man and man. As Paul says in Romans 5, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Jesus gives a, a true peace. King Jesus is going to come forward through these humble means, and He is going to conquer the world. He is going to invade the hearts of men. He is going to change them. He is going to make them new He's going to make them alive. He's going to grant them peace. And that's what the Lord did historically working in time. This isn't just an allegory. This isn't satire as, as, as one commentator liked to make about Christianity recently. This is something that is happening historically in real time and something that was prophesied from times back, which makes it different. Those two things make Christianity different from every other cult and world religion, that this is something historical happening that can be verified, and this is something that was prophesied, not just a man that come out and said, everything before me was wrong. And lastly, this is a king that comes forward in humility through humble means, but accomplishes his purpose apart from the means of the world not needing the means of the world, working through his own means to accomplish his purpose, to bring peace between man and God through the work of Christ, through the Word of God, and the work of the Spirit of God because of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the emphasis of this passage. This King that comes forward, the humility of this King, and the goodness of this King, and most especially your friends, the sufficiency of this King. I pray that you would see that. I pray that you would see the sufficiency of Christ. Let's